Hi, my name is Trash. Welcome to my channel. This is a video about lesbianism, uh, how the term has developed over the course of history, uh, historical lesbianism through today, and the way the term is used. Uh, I am not a lesbian myself. I'm a dirty, filthy bisexual uh, and non-binary, but I did the research. So I'm going to start with some ancient lesbian history. Women have been sleeping with each other since they invented sex. I don't have any proof of that, because they invented sex, I'm pretty sure, like, way before I was born. But I'm pretty sure. But we do have a lot of proof of lesbianism from the ancient world. For example, in ancient Mesopotamia, there is still writing about women having sex with other women. There's also evidence of either lesbians or a third gender category called the woman man, who were women who married other women. There's debate about whether this is lesbianism, but there's no debate that lesbian sex was happening. They weren't freaking out about it like they were in the 17th century pamphlet The Female Husband, which acted like lesbianism was something no one had ever heard of. It was brand new. No, not in ancient Mes Mesopotamia. Girls were having sex in ancient Mesopotamia. Full stop. Ancient Egypt, there's a bunch of preserved evidence of lesbian activities there. There's a bunch of love spells recorded of women putting love spells on other women. <laughs> That's a time-honored lesbian tradition, apparently. Ancient Greek women were fucking. I think we can all agree on that. I don't think that's up for debate. There is writings about this from Greek men who show that it was not illegal to do lesbian activity in ancient Greece, but some men frowned upon it. Some men said, gross. And then, of course, you know, we have Sappho and Sappho's contemporaries. Aaron of Teos and Gnosis of Locri were contemporaries of Sappho, who also wrote about sapphic yearning and lesbian activities in their poetry. And <laughs> writing poetry about your sapphic yearning is also a time-honored lesbian tradition. Every time I go to an IRL lesbian event, someone wants to read their poetry. Not very good poetry a lot of the time, but we all listen anyway, because some of us want to get laid. Ancient India treated gay sex as a minor crime, worthy of a fine. The fine for lesbian activity was less than the fine for gay sex between two men, and heterosexual premarital sex as well. But if a lesbian deflowered a virgin, she would lose two of her fingers. That was the punishment. So, yikes. Moving on to medieval times. Medieval Judaism considered lesbian activity, sex between two women, to be a minor offense. Um, but it wasn't an offense in and of itself. Women were not punished for fornication. They were just punished for rebellion. So while this activity was obviously well understood as something that happened because it was recorded, it wasn't itself a sin so much as it was a rebellion. It wasn't the same as male fornication, in their view. Arab scholars in medieval times, uh, some of them, this varied a lot, it's a big part of the world, a lot of Arab scholars considered this to be a disease, an illness. It was caused by the itching and heat of the labia, and it could be relieved by female ejaculate from another woman, whereas male ejaculate would just make the itching worse, because it added heat. Yeah, and some people considered it to be a birth defect. They considered homosexuality in both men and women to be a birth defect in the Arab world. Um, there's a lot of varying scholars on this in this time period, in this part of the world, but those were kind of the two main theories. People think that lesbians were less strictly punished in medieval times than um, their gay male counterparts, and while less of them were discovered, technically, um, the punishments remained the same in a lot of places. In a lot of places in Europe, the punishment for both male sodomy and female sodomy were being burned to death. And over a dozen women were burned to death for female sodomy. A large percentage of these were actually nuns. Um, a lot of 15th century nuns were burned to death for female sodomy. Some very wealthy noble women were able to get away with just imprisonment and penance for their homosexuality but this was not the norm. So basically we know from the ancient and medieval world that lesbian activity has pretty much always been happening. It's always happened. It always will. It's just a normal variation of human behavior. Lesbianism really took off in the 1800s. The Victorians had this strange idea that women didn't have sexualities, that they just inherently weren't sexual beings. 
So the close friendships of the Victorian women were encouraged. Women were encouraged to be very close with their friends. And since women in the Victorian era were very confined to the domestic sphere, their close friendships weren't really monitored by the outside world all that much. And when women were caught in the throes of um, wifely activities with another woman, they were just thought to be close friends, romantic pals, or practicing for marriage. So in this era, when women would have sexual relationships with each other, it was more pushed out of sight than it was overtly punished. In the United States during this time period, we had what were called Boston marriages, which was when two women were roommates with no intention of marrying a man. They just settled down in an apartment together. Two gal pals living the single life together. These were considered platonic and fine, <laughs> until that coke fiend Freud showed up and blew up their spot. He was all like, what if the women are fucking? And people were like, oh my god, what if the women are fucking? And then, you know, Boston marriages suddenly weren't all that fine and dandy and socially acceptable anymore. Thanks, Freud, you horrible little freak. So in the 1900s, it was a lot less socially acceptable and a bit more obvious when people were engaging in lesbian activities. Uh, people were looking for it more, and it was more stigmatized now. So, obviously, their spa was blown up, and they had to go more underground with everything. In 1950, the government put out a report called Employment of Homosexuals and Other Sex Perverts in Government. Raise your hand if you're a homosexual or other sex pervert. The Lavender Scare was all about lesbians being employed in government, trying to root out all of the secret lesbians. In some places, they had to stop enforcing these anti-homosexuality laws against lesbians because it was all lesbians all the way down. Oops, all lesbians. A lesbian in the hand is worth two in the... Uh, anyway, there were too many lesbians and they couldn't enforce it. Nice. Based. While being a homosexual was illegal, and they would literally arrest you, print your name in the newspaper doxing you, and charge you with crimes for lesbian activities, um, queer people still found places to gather. They still found queer spaces, and sometimes these were sex-segregated. Sometimes there were spaces which were very much men's spaces. Sometimes there were spaces which were very much lesbian spaces. But... A lot of these bars, a lot of the gay bars back in the repressive 1950s and 60s were mixed sex bars where queers of all types gathered. Stonewall was a bar which hosted lesbians, gay men, and <laughs> all kinds of other people. Street queens, um, trans women, though we didn't really have that terminology specifically at the time. These bars were very sex integrated as are most of the bars today. There were lesbian-specific spaces, though. There were a lot of lesbian-specific bars at this time, though they were very underground because of the crime involved. On September 8th, 1954, multiple lesbian-specific bars were raided in San Francisco. When police would raid lesbian bars, they would often sexually assault the women there. They would force women to strip down naked in the streets to prove they weren't wearing male underwear because cross-dressing, wearing more than a certain amount of male garments was illegal for lesbians at the time. Though many of these laws were enforced against people we now would call trans men. At the time, that was just cross-dressing and lesbianism. Those were the terms used. They would sexually assault these women in the street and then cart them off to jail and dox them. And on this night in 1954, multiple bars were raided. And the lesbian community in San Francisco came together afterwards and formed the Daughters of Belaitis, which was meant to be a lesbian organization for lesbians to gather together. It was meant to host sort of a social club type of thing, but it became so much more than that. They started organizing uh, all kinds of social events and dances, which was what a lot of the original founders wanted since they weren't allowed to dance with other women in public. 
so they wanted these events. But soon they began engaging in political activism. They put out a lesbian newspaper called The Ladder, which did amazing work, just reporting on all kinds of lesbian issues, sending newspapers out to lesbians all across the country. And other chapters were formed outside of San Francisco, and they also wrote their own publications. This became the first major organization for lesbian activism in the United States. But as happens with a lot of queer organizations, it fell to a lot of the same infighting and problems as the Mattachine Society, where there are different factions. And one of those factions are what are called uh, assimilationists. They want to be straight, basically. They want gay people to look and act straight, to be straight passing. A lot of lesbians during this time were shamed for wearing male clothing. They were shamed for not being feminine enough. And the Daughters of the Light is considered a huge success when one particularly butch lesbian, who I don't know what her identity is now, but this one butch lesbian who always presented male, put on a skirt and dressed feminine for one of their conferences. And this was celebrated as this huge victory in being respectable. Respectability politics was the name of the game for a lot of queer organizing at this time, both the Daughters of Belitis and the Mattachine Society, which was sort of their gay male counterpart. This was before the lesbian separatist movement. This was before the political lesbianism feminist ideology happened, um, but it was definitely a precursor to it. These people wanted to abandon the plight of transmasculine people of what at the time were just called butches, to focus on this respectability politics of presenting cishet, of passing in cishet society, and gaining their respect by looking and acting like them. And this is also a precursor to this infighting of, like, who can call themselves a lesbian? The people who want to be assimilationist lesbians, oh, we're normal, we're just same-sex attracted, but we're normal, um, want to exclude these people who have different experiences so that they look respectable. That's this whole LGB without the T thing, they want to abandon the queers and just focus on those of them that are cishet passing, straight passing. So there were protests before Stonewall. There was organizing before Stonewall. There were these lesbian and gay specific organizations and organizations, including both, who were fighting for their rights as, at the time, it was just considered homosexuals, but queers in general. They were fighting for their rights, but it all came to a head at Stonewall when they tried to raid Stonewall. And it was just like any other night. People were out being gay together. And the police expected them not to put up a fight because they never had. This one butch lesbian named Stormy. Stormy Della Valerie. <laughs> Probably butchered that. She screamed out as she was being arrested, as she was being shoved into a van and probably would have been sexually assaulted by the police, as was the norm for these queer women when they were arrested. She yelled out, why don't you guys do something at the gathering crowd? And they did. People started throwing bricks. They started fighting back against the police. The women's prison across the street heard what was happening, and they started lighting things on fire and shouting in solidarity. Some guy down the street at a straight bar heard what was happening. He just heard, they're rioting against the police. And he was not a gay man, but he heard this and he was like, yeah, fuck the police. He didn't even know why they were rioting, but he ran down the street and joined. What a cool guy. And in the 70s was the introduction of political lesbianism. Political lesbianism is an ideology which states that any woman should just choose to be a lesbian. That's a thing that you can do. You can choose to be a lesbian. And the way that you chose to be a lesbian under lesbian separatism was to just not sleep with men anymore. This meant that people who were only attracted to women, just keep doing what you're doing. Bisexual women, stop sleeping with men. Straight women, be celibate forever. So, not great. But it was kind of this movement focused on women's solidarity. And it was kind of the idea of like, just stop sleeping with men. Stop centering men. Stop dealing with men at all. We're going to build our own little lesbian communes. We're going to fight only for lesbian rights. Women who refuse to be political lesbians, they don't have to be full lesbians, just political lesbians, meaning they don't ever sleep with men anymore. Those people are abandoning feminism. They're against us. They're siding with men, and that's bad. 
political lesbianism is kind of an interesting theoretical mind game, but it completely failed in practice. Lesbian separatism and political lesbianism were largely a failed experiment. Sorry, TERFs. Oh god, this is not nearly as brief of a history as I was hoping for. History is a big fat lesbian and I am still deep inside her right now. Okay, then the AIDS crisis happened. I've got a rush right now. The AIDS crisis happened. Lesbians were less affected than gay men, but they weren't totally unaffected because in the lesbian community, there were bisexuals. Bisexuals were sleeping together. The bisexuals did serve as a vector of AIDS between the gay male community and the lesbian community and the cis community at large, spreading AIDS beyond just the bounds of gay men. Society hadn't accepted bisexuality yet because um, they didn't want to. So... Having to find out that way was not great, and that just really stained bisexuality for a lot of people. It made bisexuality less acceptable in the cishet society, in the gay male society, and in the lesbian community. Because at this time, bisexuals were just considered to be under the lesbian umbrella. They were called lesbians. They were called the same words as any other person who was attracted to women. Lesbians were key to the survival of the queer community during the AIDS crisis. They cared for the sick and dying, they kept our histories, and they kept the queer fight alive. Well, that brings us to the modern era. The era of internet discourse. The discourse over who is and isn't allowed to call themselves a lesbian has been going on for a long time. A 1973 article from the lesbian newspaper Lavender Woman says this, To me, a lesbian is a woman-oriented woman. Bisexuals can be lesbians. A lesbian does not have to be exclusively woman-oriented. She does not have to prove herself in bed. She does not have to hate men. She does not have to be sexually active at all times. She does not have to be a radical feminist. She does not have to like bars, like gay culture, or like being gay. When lesbians degrade other lesbians for not going to bars, not coming out, being bisexual, or not sexually active, and so on, we oppress each other. So obviously this exact same discourse was happening in the 70s. Who's allowed to be a lesbian? That article, that quote, could very well have come from Tumblr.com in 2024, but it didn't. It's from the 1970s. That's 50 years ago. In the modern day, the word lesbian refers to homosexual women. Women high on the Kinsey scale, I know that's not necessarily the correct measurement, but women who are almost or totally exclusively attracted to women and only engage in sexual activity with women. That's what the word means in the very modern context in 2024. But it didn't always mean that. Back in the 70s, the lesbian community and lesbian movement referred to what we today would call the sapphic community or the sapphic movement. It referred to women who love women, women who sleep with other women, or the way we use sapphic today is often non-men who sleep with other non-men or non-men who sleep with women. So it encompassed all of these different identities, like bisexuals, pansexuals, um, a lot of people who today we would consider trans men or trans masculine were called just butch back then. They were all lumped into the butch category, the way that trans women and a lot of gay men were kind of lumped into the category of drag queen in the 90s. It's not a term that really totally encompassed all of those people, but that's how it was used at the time. So. All of those people who today we would consider all of these different identities would have been called lesbians back in like the 70s. But this debate was happening then too. So there was a lot of discourse about whether bisexual women counted. This was even happening in the 70s when the radical lesbian movement was happening. It was happening in the 90s. We saw a lot of that in our queer literature then. Um, a quote from uh, the book Femme, Feminists, Lesbians, and Bad Girls discusses the old adage, don't date a femme, she'll leave you for a man. There was discourse happening that basically people thought that butches were the only real lesbians, and all of the femmes were just bisexuals basically doing sex tourism in the lesbian community. So, discourse. The queer community loves it. We always have. And as I said about the political lesbian movement, 
Um, this was happening in the 70s, and there was a lot of discourse surrounding this. Basically, they said that people weren't real lesbians if they ever slept with men. They were doing that gold star stuff. You can never sleep with a man or you don't count as a lesbian. Oh, come on. Like you've never fucked a twink in an alley behind the fetish club. Get real. No. So, all right. Bisexual here. So there's the dominant model right now that your sexuality is how you're born. It's inherent to who you are. It's not fluid. You're born a lesbian. You're born bisexual. You're born straight. It never changes. That's kind of our dominant model of sexuality in the current modern time. But historically, a lot of things were more fluid and the categories were more broad. So a bisexual could be a lesbian. She just kind of had to not sleep with men or she counted as a lesbian even if she did because she was dating women. And lesbianism was defined as someone who was dating women, a woman dating women. So it is very complicated and difficult to parse out what a lesbian is since the word has changed. And that's why I made this chart. As you can see, I have cis women, non-binary people, trans men in masks, and trans women in femmes. In the center here, encapsulating literally all of these identities, is the term sapphic. Sapphic is used nowadays to apply to basically anyone who's not specifically a man, who's primarily interested in women, or just interested in women in general. This includes certain trans men in masks who still identify as lesbians. In the 1960s and 70s lesbian movement, all of these people would have been put under the term lesbian. They would have been included in that term because it was an overarching term for the women love women community. And that included certain people who then would have been called butches, but people who were born uh, and assigned female at birth and later identified as men and lived as men, but still identified under the lesbian label. This was not uncommon throughout history, um, especially in this 1960s and 70s lesbian movement. There were people who then they were kind of called butch lesbians or mask lesbians, but they were part of the lesbian movement. They lived their lives as men and using he, him pronouns, but still identified as lesbians. Um, it wasn't that weird. It was a little weird, but it really wasn't that weird. The term lesbian has changed over time, as happens with a lot of words. And now it refers to primarily women who are only interested in women. The definition has narrowed over time to mean women only interested in women. It no longer includes people of just varying identities that were previously lumped under the lesbian label. This same thing happened with gay men and bisexual men. It was all just considered gay men for a long time. Now we have separate identities that were previously under the lesbian umbrella, which are now separate identities in and of themselves, like sapphic, bisexuals, pansexuals, things that previously would have been lesbians, but now they are no longer under that label because the labeling has narrowed. And that's where all of these unaccounted for lesbians have gone. They were simply defined out of existence. They're still around, they just identify as other labels because the lesbian label narrowed so as to no longer apply to them. And my friends, that is where all of the lesbians have disappeared off to. Now they're under different labels like sapphic, bisexual, whatever. And the big like debate here about who's allowed to identify as a lesbian comes down to this labeling. These people who previously would have been called lesbians are no longer under the strict, narrow definition of the word. And some of them still want to identify that way in the classical sense of lesbian, which means someone who engaged in lesbian activities. But because the definition has narrowed, a lot of people think lesbian no longer includes these people. And that's the crux of the debate.
So if you showed up to a lesbian party, a lesbian establishment in the 1960s and 70s, you would have been faced with a lot of transmasculine people, what we today would identify as transmasculine and non-binary people. You might have seen some trans lesbians, some trans women who identified as lesbians there. You might have seen a lot of bisexual women because bisexual people are the largest slice of the LGBTQ plus community. You would have seen all of these people who today would not be identified as lesbians. But at that time, during the 1960s and 70s lesbian movement, they were lesbians. That was the correct term for their identities, even though today they would be bisexual, non-binary, transmasculine, what have you. So when I go to IRL events today, which are for lesbians, I see exactly the same thing. The same people are at these events that were at these events in the 60s and 70s. So as we can see, what constitutes a lesbian has been up for debate for a long time and probably always will be. But let's talk about lesbian erasure. Let's talk about this concept that the lesbians are disappearing. I hate to th say this, folks. I hate to say it, but the TERFs are actually right about this. Don't cancel me. What I'm saying is lesbian spaces have been steadily disappearing. There are far less lesbian specific spaces now than there were in 2002. The percentage of lesbians in the queer community has gone down. They're less of the population of the queer community than ever. 78% of queer women identify as bisexual while only 19% of queer men identify as bisexual. Lesbians make up only 16% of the queer community right now. There are only 23 dedicated lesbian bars in the entire United States versus over 800 gay or mixed sex queer bars in the United States. And there are mean stereotypes about lesbians, like they're man-hating, they're ugly, whatever, you know. So why are lesbians only a small portion of the queer community compared to gay men and bisexuals? Well, let's listen to what the TERFs have to say. Katie Herzog wrote this article that I read. It was called, Where Have All the Lesbians Gone? Where she's like lamenting that everyone's non-binary, everyone's just queer nowadays. And that was very upsetting to her. And her argument was that women are more prone to social contagion. She literally is using girl brain theory to explain why the poor little dumb girls are identifying as other stuff now. It's a social contagion. They're just so silly and stupid. Very feminist of you, Katie Herzog. Very feminist. And then I read this stupid book, The Disappearing L, which documents the entire lesbian and radical feminist movement with all of the like huge women's festivals and concerts and stuff that were happening in the 70s uh, with lesbian culture. And she blames the acceptance of trans people for why these events stopped being cool and popular. But a lot of these events did welcome trans women. So that doesn't really hold up, even in her own book. So what is the truth? I read a Lesbians Over Everything article entitled, Why I'm a Lesbian, Not Queer. And the author of that says, most same-sex attracted women my age prefer the word queer. It has one syllable. It's big enough to include all of the little doubts and details that don't fit into gay. That's the kind of the crux of what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, lesbian as a word has shrunk to mean just homosexual women over time. And a lot of the community is bisexual. So that no longer applies to them. Combined with these very people gatekeeping the identity and saying, you're not a real lesbian if you had tingly feelings when you watched Orlando Bloom as Legolos. Or you're not a real lesbian if seeing David Tennant act like a weird little freak excites you at all. You're not a real lesbian. That's kind of their whole thing is telling people they're not real lesbians. And then they turn around and they ask, where have all the lesbians gone?
bitch, you kicked them out of the word. You kicked them out of your community. You said, you're not a real lesbian. You're too bisexual. You're too thin to be a real lesbian. That was you. You're dating a trans woman, so you're not a real lesbian. That was you. You said that. Where have all the lesbians gone? Are you kidding me? You got rid of them. Now everyone's bisexual because you told them they weren't real lesbians. I mean, that's not the only reason, but... That feels <laughs> like it was relevant. Feels like all of this gatekeeping of the lesbian identity is relevant to why there's less people identifying as lesbians than ever. Does that not feel relevant to you? And there actually is like some validity to this like people are feeling pressured to identify as bisexual nowadays thing. They have seen some stuff like this where it's like very young women. Like I saw this one specific post that I'm gonna talk about. This very young lesbian or whatever was saying that she wasn't sure if she should identify as a lesbian she really felt like the term applied to her but she wasn't attracted to anyone with a penis she wasn't interested in having sex with a penis but she was attracted to some trans men so she was like should i identify as bisexual to include these trans men or should i identify as a lesbian which i just feel like describes me better and in the comments a bunch of people were saying you're a lesbian trans men are women you're you should st identify as a lesbian um but i actually agree that she should identify as a lesbian not because trans men aren't men they are but because she said that she feels the term describes her best and they also say oh you'll be canceled for not liking trans people blah 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 but the only real consequence of her calling herself a lesbian in this case is that trans men might not want to date her because they won't feel like her identity aligns with their gender identities. That's the only consequence. Trans men and trans masks might not want to date you if you use lesbian over bisexual. If you ever fall madly in love with a trans woman who hasn't had bottom surgery, you can just be like, I don't know what I'm doing with that thing. Um, and just, you know, have a conversation. Scary, I know. I guess it is intimidating to have a conversation with someone to be like, look, I only like to have sex in these specific ways. Uh, and our anatomies don't align like that. And I'm sorry, but they don't. So I guess we just aren't compatible. We're not physically compatible. But that's a conversation a lot of people have to have. I don't know what to tell you. Um, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that as a bisexual. I'm just like, you know, just talk to people. Sometimes you're not physically compatible with another person, and that's just how it is. It's not any different just because it's a trans person. Just, you know, have a conversation. And I feel like telling this girl to identify as bisexual because she's attracted to the occasional trans man or to not identify as bisexual because they think that trans men are women or whatever. Um, it's just the bi-pan debate all over again. It's just like telling her what to identify as. It's telling her you have to identify this way because of my preconceived notions about what those identities are. She said she liked the lesbian label. So let her identify as a lesbian. It literally doesn't matter. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect you. The only person it affects is her and her dating pool. Who would be interested in dating her? Her label is lesbian. Trans men might not want to date her. That's the only thing it affects. Gay men are a much higher percentage of the queer male population versus gay women exclusively gay women, far more women identify as bisexual than lesbian versus gay men versus bisexual men. Now, people will say, these are top talking points I've heard, that the reason is because women are not allowed to have definite sexualities. They're not allowed to be purely lesbian, anti-man. They have to center men at all times or else they're, you know, mistreated. And yeah, I... Yeah, there's some credence to that. There's men punching women in New York. Incels are a thing. 
But the real reason, hear me out here, the real reason that far more women identify as bisexual than men isn't because lesbians are being erased. It's because bisexual men are being erased. In my own personal life, I know so many bisexual men who don't openly identify as bisexual because the stigma of male bisexuality is so strong. Uh, there's a video I highly recommend. It's Verily Bitchy's video on why we hate bisexual men. Uh, I won't get into it right now. It's also my video about uh, bisexuality and the bi pan debate. I talk about how bisexual men, the AIDS crisis really gave them really bad PR, and bi male bisexuality is highly stigmatized, even compared to, compared to female bisexuality. It's highly stigmatized. So, men who experience attraction to other men are far more likely to identify as either gay or straight and not bisexual, even though the term bisexual is more accurate to their experience because it's so highly stigmatized for them. So the erasure of bisexual men is more the cause of why there are far more bisexual women than bisexual men, rather than lesbians being erased in this case. I think that's really obvious from studies and statistics and talking to bisexual men. And people's identities can change too. There's uh, the stereotype that bisexuality is just a stepping stone to gayness, which I actually find the opposite to be true. Um, there's this document online called The Lesbian Master Doc, which is supposed to definitively tell you if you're a lesbian. It has like this big long list of like questions to ask yourself about whether or not you're a lesbian. And the author of it, who then identified as a lesbian, later came out as bisexual because she realized she was not a lesbian. She's bisexual. I feel the same way as like um, non-binary identities. A lot of people consider non-binary identities to be sort of a stepping stone to being full-blown transgender. Like, oh, you're just like experimenting and then you're going to be a trans man or a trans woman. Uh, eventually you'll just come out as that. But I've also found the opposite to be the case a lot of the time. A lot of people I have known who were identifying as binary trans women or binary trans men later were like, you know what? I'm a little more fluid than that. Uh, and that's fine. It's a good thing to keep exploring who you are and delving into your identity. Uh, and the same is true of like this lesbian label, like people who identify as a lesbian and then find, oh, well, that twink is cute. Let's talk about lesbian bars. There's been a 45% reduction in the amount of gay and lesbian bars since 2002. Lesbian bars um, have been hit about as hard as gay bars, but these kind of bars that more focus on gay men and also on just being mixed sex spaces, uh, there's just been far more of them in general. Lesbian bars, there haven't been as many historically. Um, a lot of lesbian establishments we had in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of like lesbian bookstores and that kind of thing, rather than bars, and those have been hit hard as well. So why are the gay bars disappearing? The gay and the lesbian bars, why are they disappearing? Well, gay people are more accepted now. It doesn't feel that way because there's been this huge backlash the past few years. But in 2002, a gay couple could not just walk into any bar. No, you could be hate crime. I mean, that still happens, but nowadays um, it's a lot more acceptable for a gay couple to just go into any bar. You don't have to worry about it as much. Of course, that's changing now, but you know, um, back then we couldn't do that. If you were dating a woman and you were a woman or presented as a woman, you couldn't just go and be like making out with her at the bar. That's much more acceptable now. There are less lesbian specific spaces. And most of the gay bars, most gay bars in general, are mixed sex gay spaces. Just like Stonewall was, just like they were in the 50s. There are like lesbian specific bars, but a lot of the bars are gay and lesbian bars. You go there and it's not just, you know, gay men. It's lesbians, gay men, miscellaneous queers, um, trans people, you know, like 
It's a bar for queer people, the whole community. The lesbian specific bars, there were less of them, and that is because lesbians were also going to the other bars. So, because queer people no longer had to only patronize gay specific bars, they had more acceptance in the general society. Which I know it doesn't feel that way anymore, but that is true. Um, it was safer to go to regular bars for gay people. They just stopped going to gay bars, and as a result, the gay bars closed. And that's kind of what happened. Uh, that's what happened in a lot of these cases. Another factor in the closure of a lot of gay spaces is dating apps. A lot of people that I talked to online pinned the blame on dating apps. They said that a lot of the reason that they went to gay bars in the first place was to meet with people they could hook up with. And now they just swipe on their phone and you practically order a hookup to your house. So they didn't have to go to bars, so they didn't, so the bars closed. Nowadays, the queer community is chronically online, terminally online, just so online. A lot of you guys are not going to in real life queer spaces. You're not supporting DIY venues. You're not going to parties with other gay people. You're just behind a screen and ordering hookups to your house on your phone. Um, I sound like a boomer right now, but that's true. The hookup culture being on the phone now meant that there was less use for gay bars. Nowadays, every time I go to a gay bar, it's pretty much just to see my friend's bad drag performances. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you want to protect gay and lesbian spaces, um, go to them. Spend money at them. Pokemon, go to the gay bar. This lack of real physical space all of these gay bars closing and everyone being behind a screen is like really bad. Again, not to be a boomer, but it's actually really bad for the community. And that's what leads to a lot of the queer discourse. The queer identity, the queer community, it turns very theoretical when you're only seeing it behind a screen, when you're not going to events, when you're not seeing real people and communicating with them. When I go to real queer spaces in physical reality, People are not obsessing over your identity. They're not obsessing over who belongs here, who gets to call themselves what identity, and how that affects their dating pool. They're socializing, they're drinking, and they're reading their terrible lesbian poetry. They're meeting people and they're seeing if they like that person based on their chemistry with that person, not based on complicated labels that may or may not match up. They're not they're not suspiciously examining someone's identity, their ideology, their terminology and telling them whether or not they belong in this space. That's crazy conspiracy brain thinking. No one's doing that in the real lesbian spaces I go to, and if they were, we would kick them out, because that would seem like a crazy person. Like that lady who's making the bar where they're going to check your genitals at the door. People don't behave that way in real life. And it seems like a good idea online, I guess. But we really shouldn't be segregating ourselves into these little micro communities of like, oh, this is a trans mask community. This is a lesbian community. This is a bisexual community. This is a game. It, it shouldn't work like that in real life because we're queer. And solidarity between queer people has been the way that our community has survived. It's really the only thing that's gotten us through constant attacks on our survival. And it's the only thing that will get us through this next wave of attacks on our survival. So, you know, meet people in real life. And if you truly believe that you have the right to police who belongs in a community, who gets to call themselves what, if you want to say trans mask lesbians don't count, don't get to call themselves that, bisexual lesbians don't get to call themselves that, trans men who still want to call themselves lesbians don't get to do that, trans women, you don't get to be lesbians. If you want to say that, if you want to say all of these things, I want you to go to a real, physical queer space. I want you to meet in real life lesbians. And I want you to say that in real life to their faces. I want you to say those things to people's faces. And I want you to say it with your chest. Whenever I go to real life queer spaces, <laughs> no one's being a crazy conspiracy brained person. Like, does that person really count as a lesbian? Do they really count? Are you really... When I go to queer spaces, it's a bunch of transmasculine people. It's a bunch of lesbians. It's a bunch of 
people whose identities they don't even have a word for they're just vibing they're just being queer it's a lot of queers do you want to know what people are talking about at lesbian gatherings do you really want me to tell you what they're actually talking about what's actually being discussed at these gatherings people are talking about freeing palestine and stopping cop city in atlanta they're not talking about micro labels from tumblr.com that's what people in sapphic spaces care about <laughs> social justice issues our continued survival on this planet the plight of other marginalized people yeah so not to be a boomer again but log off log off get off of your computer and go to a gay bar and spend some money there that's how you preserve your queer spaces it's not online discourse and yelling at trans women go to a gay bar the boomers are right in this case log off and go to a gay bar being exclusionary won't save queer spaces it can't it won't it never will the queer spaces that survive are the ones that are not exclusionary the ones that welcome queer people of all stripes that have various events that have events for different types of people the most successful gay bars in the region i live in are ones that host bad drag shows that host bear nights although nowadays bear night is just pup night those pup hoods have taken over the community everyone's a pup now i'm for it this is a pro pup space okay woof woof they host lesbian nights they host all kinds of these queer events and community events and they're not exclusionary they're not saying you got to be the right kind of gay to come here because places that do that don't survive the lady running the genital check bar no one's gonna go to that it's gonna fail unless she has like mommy and daddy's money to fund it for a while it'll fail because exclusionary queer spaces don't last and excluding people and being really pedantic and whiny is not going to make lesbianism better it's not going to make lesbianism better it's just going to make your life worse okay gays gays look at me look at me this is called a steamer Thank you.